Hello friends, uh, uh, this is uh, CEC Gurukul live lecture series and uh, good afternoon to you. Uh, we now we begin the series and the title of the series uh, which has been on for a number of months now is the romantic trend in English writing and uh, under this uh, we have had lectures on Wordsworth, Coleridge, Blake and others and uh, today we have a lecture on uh, P. B. Shelley, the important romantic poet. The resource person with us is Dr. Echa Bajaj, who teaches English literature in Hindu College, Delhi University. Dr. Echa Bajaj has done extensive work on uh, writing in English in India and uh, she also has uh, uh, worked on literary theory. Uh, she has a book to her credit, that book is called uh, 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 the uh, Muktibod in Our Time. Uh, now, uh, today she is speaking on uh, the, the title of the uh, uh, talk is uh, the uh, poet P. B. Shelley, Romant uh, Revolutionary Romantic. So these two words are heavy words and uh, uh, one has to find out what romanticism means, what kind of romanticism this person uh, represented, uh, the time in which he wrote and uh, in fact uh, I would ask Dr. Richa Bajaj to uh, tell us about uh, in brief about romanticism, the, the time when it emerged and uh, uh, P. B. Shelley and then we can continue with the discussion. Hey, Dr. Richa Bajaj, welcome and please begin. Uh, yes, so with respect to P.B. Shelley, uh, when we are looking at then, we are looking at the younger romantics. Mm -hmm. We have already covered as a session on, uh, sessions on the older, the elder romantics who wrote around 1798, mm -hmm. um, which includes uh, Wordsworth and um, Wordsworth and Coleridge and before that is Blake. So we have covered these three, these were, these are known to be the pioneers of romantic uh, poetry and after that uh, we have a set of these new writers who came to the fore, uh, P. B. Shelley, Keats and Byron. Well, what do you understand by romanticism? Let us tell our viewers that. Uh, see, romanticism of course now has many kind of meanings uh, mm -hmm. today, but uh, in the time when it came to the fore, uh, particularly in the 1790s, mm -hmm. then it um, in a way it was one, it, it, uh, it um, emphasized imagination, it emphasized the ma mental faculty of uh, uh, human beings in a different manner, in a different manner as it was perceived or conceived before this time by uh, the Augustan age poets who looked at uh, uh, the um, mental faculty as uh, solely or purely rational and based on the principle of uh, reason or rationality or going with the scientific temper of the time. Mm. But when uh, the romantic poets come to the fore, then uh, their use of the term romantic does not mean that they negate um, the mental faculties or they negate the intellectual ca capacities of um, man. In fact, they try to temper uh, rationality with a kind of uh, imaginative or instinctual uh, uh, sensibility. And this is what uh, they believe then that alters the whole uh, way that uh, the alters the perspective of the times that one uh, that pure ra rationality or pure science uh, cannot be the answer because man for them is not just uh, a set of rules or uh, matter but there is feeling and emotion attached with this matter so the material reality cannot be understood in terms of uh, scientific facts and facts can only be one part of truth for them the other truth uh, lies in the, this domain of mystery this domain of um, uh, instinct and nature and I think for them uh, hum the human being is a complex phenomena in itself and cannot be reduced to the uh, very basic elements or matter in that sense. I think it is quite clear, uh, now we understand what romanticism is, uh, this, this is based mainly on imagination even though behind imagination there is also reason. There, there is reason. reason. So, it is not to say that this, they cut their ties from mm. reason and mm. they do not believe that reason. In some cases of course, they talk about the harmful effects that uh, the city life or the life of um, uh, the, the or daunting material life or the din of the city the, creates. The organized life. Right, the organized life. and the socially organized life mm -hmm. that uh, the, the way it mars or harms the human being and yet uh, what they feel is that the primal instinct is what keeps us alive, is what uh, mm -hmm. brings us back to our basic self mm -hmm. which is probably not uh, the kind of evolutionary self that we understand ourselves to be. 
Tell us about uh, P.B. Shelley then. So P.B. Shelley in this particular framework when we, uh, when we, under, when we try to look at or locate uh, P.B. Shelley actually, then uh, P.B. Shelley is one of these, one uh, is the most fiery of uh, the romantics in that sense and the most passionate of uh, amongst them. Uh, he, there is, um, Wordsworth is defined probably by his intensity and uh, uh, Coleridge also delves into the supernatural. but. Uh, at the same time, when we return, when we come to P.B. Shelley, then he is a poet of passion, of dreams, of idealism, of uh, uh, it is that kind of romanticism that you see in P.B. Shelley. Can you explain the word fiery that you are used particularly for Shelley? Yes, fiery in the sense when I come to the uh, biographical details of uh, Shelley, perhaps we will be able to look at it better. Mm -hmm. But what I, when I say fiery is that he is uh, he's, uh, he's one of those poets who does not uh, mince words, he does not, uh, he is very clear on the sides that he takes and if he is expelled from college then he does not mind it, he would welcome it as uh, in event in his he life. Exci he so excites the reader right. to think, Yes, to excites dream. because the poet himself is so excited mm. uh, with what he is doing and mm. what his duty is or what he feels he is meant to do. He is one of those poets who actually believes that he is born to do something mm. and who believes that the work he is doing is actually very important. So, that that is why I said that he has this fiery spirit in him and, um, and uh, incorrigible in that sense, you know, uh, if I could use that term for him because nothing mm -hmm. daunts him, nothing can corrupt his soul and uh, he continues, he has a perspective and a viewpoint and he continues to abide by it in the short life that he had of course. Will you call him infectious because he is fiery? Yes, in a, in a way yes, he, he, can t uh, he can totally um, take you in the flow hmm. and um, uh, make you believe what he believes in. A so, it is a powerful poet hmm. in that sense, that is why so the passion with which, so because he genuinely believes in it, so he is able to create that hmm. uh, for the reader. While uh, Wordsworth also I think was of the category, he genuinely believed in the experience that he had and therefore he could uh, transfer that and make the reader believe in that experience, but um, Shelley is more uh, perspective oriented, he knows what he is saying and he is more social uh, or is uh, wants to mobilize uh, the yeah, people around. the other word in your uh, title and that word is revolutionary, right. romantic we understand, what is revolutionary? Yes, because he is actually uh, the poet of protest in among the romantics, he is mm -hmm. not, uh, he does not share the wit of Byron or the humor of Byron, he, he cannot become Keats in that sense, but what is peculiar about uh, Shelley is is that he believes uh, that society uh, uh, can be changed through the conscious effort of individuals I who see. participate meaningfully in it and mm -hmm. who intervene in processes of society in uh, very um, in with a, with a sense of purpose and they can give that kind of shape to an age so there is a lot of um, uh, in that sense um, uh, in his poetry, there is a kind of a movement, revolution, uh, things which are above become low and with things which are low go up. Yes, and there is a whole so there. yes, of hmm. course. So you see, he is talking about how revolutions also take place, mm -hmm. and um, in fact, Shelley is known to have uh, come up with this uh, theory of uh, uh, what he called uh, the historical evolution. And according to him, uh, th this historical evolution is something that that in every epoch in society there are uh, a set of forces that are active, mm -hmm. and one set of forces are those that belong to the despots, and it is the despotic force which is active and the other is uh, the force of liberty and he has written an ode to liberty as well. So, he says that there is and in, in every society there is this, there are these two, two set of forces which are active and in some cases the, um, uh, the despotic force is actually in ascendance and dominates the scene while in the other uh, the, uh, you know the force of uh, the people or the, the uh, uh, force of freedom or liberty is what uh, takes hold and dominates the scene and for which he also takes up these different kind of examples such as the French Revolution and the American Revolution would uh, be the periods when the force of liberty uh, gained in ascendance and on the other hand when he is talking about the despots then he refers 
refers to the ancient Rome, period of ancient Rome or the period of Charles I in England. And again, the Cromwellian uh, period then he associates with this period when the force of liberty is in ascendance. So, it is that kind of a clash. In fact, his Prometheus Unbound is based on this kind of an equation between the despot and the uh, the fighter who is fighting for Prometheus who is in chains and is fighting for freedom. So, it is this kind of a relationship that he also explores in some of his poems and plays. Uh, now, that you have uh, very clearly enunciated uh, these two words uh, romantic and revolutionary, I mm. think you can go ahead with the argument further. Right. I am mean, curious to know and viewers also would be curious to know as to what, what it stands for. Right. Mm. So, uh, mm. before uh, that let us just briefly look at what uh, mm. P. B. Shelley, uh, just some biographical details of P. B. Shelley. Uh, you should be able to see them on your screen. Uh, so, Shelley is actually born in 1792. He's he was born in an aristocratic family and um, conservative. His father was a pro parliamentarian and um, Shelley was also in line to become a baron. So, he belongs to a well to do family. They had enough money and he could sustain himself and so it is kind of uh, a paradox that Shelley uh, does not actually uh, follow that route and does not become uh, to uh, take the root of the f uh, of his family and lineage and turns into this revolutionary poet as he does. So, he had a good gr grasp of Latin and Greek because he read them uh, in his school days and at 18 he joined then Oxford. Uh, a couple of months in Oxford, he actually developed this kind of a religious skepticism during this time and uh, he wrote just a few months in Oxford and he wrote this uh, kind of a uh, so to speak a blasphemous kind of an essay. Uh, which is titled The Necessity of Atheism uh, along with his friend James Hogg and uh, as first year students and this was circulated in Oxford this uh, pamphlet it was anonymous but uh, everybody knew who had written this. So, in 1811 he published this pamphlet where he discusses the necessity of atheism and uh, he says he actually refutes the idea of God, God's existence and says uh, in the pamphlet that well uh, that uh, religion is merely he says a, and I quote a passion of the mind and unquote. So, basically it is not something real it is not it does not have it cannot be proven. So, therefore, it is only a passion of the mind and that university he also took a, took a dig at the university by suggesting that the university space was an advanced and, and this is within quotes uh, an advanced squadron of the English church. So, unquote. Again, very interestingly, early on, uh, as early as in 1811, Shelley is able to see the complex nexus that and the kind of a strong nexus uh, that uh, includes the church and the university. The, that is the space of teaching, the space of study, the school, and the church, with where. So, you see how, uh, how ideology is passed on through these two modes or through through these two institutions is something which is very interesting which later on would be uh, explored in detail by uh, writers, theoreticians including Marx later on. So, well as a result of this pamphlet that Shelley wrote, uh, uh, he was expelled from Oxford in the same year. But I'd like before I actually go, I'd like Dr. Anand Prakash to, uh, uh, you know, make a comment on this, on Shelley's idea in necessity of atheism, where he says that uh, the university is the advanced squadron of the English Church. Uh, what would you say? You, uh, you have very clearly, uh, uh, you know, argued in favor of uh, Shelley being an atheist and uh, a, a critic of religion at that time. And I think it was in the air right. because Wordsworth and Coleridge, both of them you would talk about the mind, the working of the mind, sometimes spiritualism also when Coleridge was concerned, but romantics were deeply rooted in the atheistic idea of the world. Hmm. And uh, they would you know dream as. But and, and yet they are criticized for being mystics or there yeah. is a sense of mysticism. You know often you when you read up on Shelley or you read up Coleridge, mm -hmm. they are often accused of being uh, mystics of sort because they believe in this kind of a hidden mysterious power uh, and that becomes open to interpretation. Actually uh, mysticism is available to human beings. Uh, mysticism is something which is which can be called the product of the human mind and uh, when human mind you know uh, breaks the chains uh, of, of the reality around, uh, around itself and starts having a kind of flight into the unknown, the mysterious, that is what mysticism is. So, I think it is a broadly a part of uh, what is called you know uh, a critique of religion because religion would always find answers. 
but these people explore and they enjoy exploration right and and they are also struck by the idea of mystery so that is very true but the point that you are making regarding uh, you know being precursor to the later revolutionaries uh, i think uh, this person stands out as as, as you have uh, already explained hmm. he is born in the year you know uh, 1792 so 3 years after the uh, french revolution you know started and uh, this 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 was and at the back was also the american revolution american war of independence and before that as you said crown cromwell revolution mm. so i think he is he seems to be a kind of crystallization of the ideas mm. that uh, you know started the movement in the 17th century england and in the 18th century when american and the and the french revolution occurred so he takes that idea forward and he is a, he, he has an open mind and he uh, you know uh, breathes uh, the values of the university where uh, minds are trained and he realizes that the training of the mind sometimes takes most of the scholars towards religion and there he uh, has i think the, this uh, particular thing that you said about uh, you know uh, um, aristocratic family and religious skepticism hmm. so he understands religion he accepts it and then he becomes uh, doubtful about it doubting yeah. about it and when he explores all these things then he realizes that uh, the world is made by human beings yes so uh, and very rightly you said that this is something which is in the air at that time because of the new sciences and new areas of study that have come up mm-hmm. uh, including economics and political theory etc and yet i feel that uh, if what one were to talk about rom- the romantics um, relationship with religion i think that uh, they become very interested in the uh, in the subject of the mind itself mm-hmm. and they try to explore the mind of hu- the human being and all romantics in fact you know it's it's a, it's a very deep exploration of the mind of a uh, human being and it is the, the it is this inward movement that actually uh, and you know at one place when shelley says that he he actually says that because uh, we have an in, in this is in one of his poems in him to intellectual beauty he says that well because we could not find answers to questions therefore we created god Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, you know that's how we created god and that's how we uh, that that's how we c- that god came alive because we could not g- answer questions now see the irony uh, the, the, the person is saying he created god Actually, yeah so maybe <laughs> i can uh, i'll come yes yes, yes yes no no not just he created god but uh, i just wanted to maybe i can uh, quote from uh, the uh, the the very poem itself so we actually understand what i'm trying to say so if you as you can see on the screen there is his hymn to intellectual beauty which was written in 1816 now and here uh, uh, he when he talks about uh, uh, you know the trumpet of prophecy and wind if uh, no not this sorry let me go to the this is the other one tell us about the time in the meantime you know this is 1810 1815 uh, the napoleonic war has ended and you know uh, people are thinking of making history they mm-hmm. are themselves participants uh, you know in, in the historical process and they are thinking about the world in which they live and and they want to change it so that way they are, they are precur- and th- this is in the air th- 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 this th- is in th- the air this kind no, of no so, so at, you know and one and in the poem this particular section that i was talking about he says i called on the poisonous names with which our youth is fed so mm. he is actually referring to god's name as the poisonous name mm. with which our youth is fed i was not heard i saw them not so and and when musing deeply on the lot of life at that sweet time when winds are wooing and and then he goes towards nature hmm. so you see the point is uh, the point that i'm trying to make is that he is conscious of how the theory of god has also evolved hmm. and how it has helped human beings to find answers to things that one did not find answers to earlier and uh, you know one is fed with also stories of ghosts hmm. so he came out as much as he came out of um, the idea of god he also came out of the idea of ghosts and superstitions so uh, these are things which he thinks are created by the mind mm-hmm. and uh, therefore uh, uh, you know and and therefore he explores the mind further is uh, something that i feel he is doing here which means that um, uh, he thinks that human mind is not easy to understand and that it has its own functionality and that when you start thinking about the mind then in fact you uh, uh, enter the domain of mysticism the the domain of the dark the domain of the possible the hmm. domain of the potential so uh, romanticism uh, gets very clearly defined by uh, shelley 
uh, in his poetry, uh, in, in his struggle to find out answers to the questions that you think he raised. So, uh, raising of the questions in the, in the early 19th century and finding answers to them, sometimes succeeding, sometimes not succeeding and yet going on, that right. seems to be the essence of uh, uh, the, so, the, this is this, this is what explains skepticism which is largely there with respect to every field and mm. in uh, which which defines the larger uh, framework of romantic writing as well mm. in that sense. So, um, let me go back to talking about uh, mm. a bit about uh, Shelley and then we can uh, continue to also talk about some of his poems which are uh, there. Uh, so, uh, uh, I left w at uh, basically the point when I said that Shelley was expelled from uh, the university, Oxford University and um, after that uh, he obviously his father asked him to recant, but Shelley did not and uh, he d decided to stay out of the, he never uh, graduated in that sense. By the way, this is a difficult word, what, what is recant? Recant means. Um, uh, to the take his word back, back. To, yes, the word the, what, back, ha what okay. he had said he must take it back. So, his father wanted him to do that, but he did not do so and was uh, continued to. Uh, was it because of his youthfulness? He would be twen in his 20s. Right, of course. At that, that time. Mm. So, so 1811. He, which means uh, less, less than. Yeah. Yes, in, in 19 years. Mm. And 18 at the, years. He's a teenager. 18. Right. And when his father asked him to recant, to, to apologize, mm. to take the words back, then this young man says no. He I doesn't. Don't do it. Yes, he doesn't. Mm. So and in uh, he uh, that was in 1811, and mm. in eight by 1813 he actually comes in touch with William Godwin, who had already who was this kind of a progressive figure at the time, who was um, uh, writing about democracy, about the rights of people, and about uh, explaining also. Um, uh, you know uh, the kind uh, the new phenomena and uh, with him uh, he uh, Shelley then became the disciple of William Godwin and later on he uh, published his uh, poetic work Queen Mab uh, uh, around the same time he fell in love with uh, Godwin's daughter Mary and married her in 1818 Mary of course is Mary Shelley as we know her famously who wrote uh, Frankenstein a gothic novel and this is after that they uh, he also moved to Italy uh, and the, he wrote extensively during this period and this is also the time when he met Byron. Uh, Shelley wrote the, his Prometheus Unbound which is a plain verse and Adonis around this time Adonis was of course dedicated to Keats and he wrote about Keats death as well and the suffering that the poet had. Of course Shelley very soon would uh, himself die he died in 1822 by drowning so he was hardly 29 years old so Keats died when he was 25 and Shelley when he was uh, barely uh, 29. Uh, so a very this eventful life. Yes. So the life of 30 years, hardly, yeah. hardly. Yes. So, uh, in in terms of Keats, generally it is suggested that he is a poet who left certain of his poetic fulfillment unfulfilled. But with uh, Shelley, uh, that kind of a uh, label is generally not attached. It's like the kind of a blaze that he has had this short life and in which he was able to write so much and also dabble with writing some kind of a uh, epic. Again, being very much influenced by Milton and um, uh, and his friends would all uh, sometimes also refer to him. As as uh, Satan or snake uh, and uh, he's also written uh, uh, a poem on that when the serpent is shut out uh, mm -hmm. so that anyway so Shelley so wrote became a kind of cult figure in cult his own figure time. yes of mm -hmm. course People. as somebody as a rebellious figure mm -hmm. as somebody who stood for protest and rebellion in his own time mm -hmm. and um, his uh, but a brush poet of with great promise he yes. has read so much he has uh, thought so I think the word fiery properly explains him right and uh, he lives his ideas and he theorizes, you know, it's not something that Shelley is, Shelley is a poet of ideas mm -hmm. also. Uh, he's a passionate poet, but it's not just passion without ideas. He's, mm -hmm. he's a poet with ideas because he's constantly struggling to explain what, how revolutions take place, how, um, how uh, things change, what, the, what is the process of change, what, what happens in the process to writers, thinkers, artists. So, he is uh, also in that sense explaining, exploring these areas. Suppose I say, how do you react? Suppose I say that in France, 
uh, people you know wrote about the revolution in society mm -hmm. these people didn't have a society to to bring revolution in right. but they, in ideas they brought about the revolution uh, maybe that's why because they they were distanced from that reality i think mm -hmm. in france they were too close to that reality and mm -hmm. that reality was as daunting as it was optimistic or gave them hopes and yet there was so much violence uh, so with poets at uh, in england uh, they could see things in the distance and uh, uh, in fact uh, evaluate better when they saw the uh, revolution from uh, far so to speak uh, and it wasn't something which was troubling them at home so they could also write about it uh, and they could also uh, evolve a kind of theory around it and he enjoyed protection of the of the, of the high family yes. to which he belonged right so so, he so there was he, there was a sense of comfort and yet from yes. that position he could write what he did he he wrote for freedom and he was all the time thinking of the world you know that that that, 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 that he didn't like but then he was actually uh, when he was very optimistic, very optimistic about the world that he did not like he wasn't among the poets who thought that nothing could happen it was a world he hated and and uh, despised with full fervor and yet he he knew that there was something else which uh, which we could work for so you're not a poet of sadness not at all not a disappointment mm. He, he wouldn't let disappointment uh, enter him the way it does with, uh, you know. Coleridge, for instance. Coleridge, for instance. Mm -hmm. That kind of dejection is not, to, even when he writes odes and talks about tragic loss or talks about, like in Revolt of Islam, he actually talks about how um, the French Revolution uh, came up and how then it was taken over by the tyranny that took place, uh, uh, you know, or the tyranny uh, afterwards. Even there, he's talking about he he's able to maintain his intellectual stamina vis a vis describing what's going on and rather uh, than emotionally becoming involved in the process. I see. So, which means that he's not a poet of sadness or melancholy the way Keats is. He right. likes Keats otherwise, hmm. but Keats' is melancholy it doesn't touch him at all. Right. So, so th th this this kind of thing is important. And uh, what is what is next? Is there something? Yes. So, um, Shelley wrote uh, two short essays also uh, around this time hmm. on love and on life. And respectively and explored the realm of each vis-a-vis -vis human endeavor. Very few of us actually know Shelley to be a poet of love as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and a poet of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, this is, uh, this is something that we can probably uh, take up, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, in brief after. Uh, uh, you, you can do that, definitely. Okay. So, uh, 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 so Shelley wrote these two essays and then he explored the realms of each vis-a-vis -vis human endeavor. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, after that, uh, you see, when we look at uh, love and uh, we'll, I can actually refer to one of the poems that he has written uh, on uh, love and uh, what he says in the poems. This is from the... He is not known as a poet of love, so I am exactly. curious to know. Yeah, mm -hmm. and there are a couple of them where he is actually talking about uh, the experience of love mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know the kind of uh, relationship that he shares with the beloved now in this uh, particular poem uh, which is one word is too often profaned uh, written in 18 uh, of, of course written around 1820s but published posthumously in 1824 um, so this is one word is too often profaned mm -hmm. and here you notice that uh, one word is too often profaned for me to profane it one feeling too falsely disdained for thee to disdain it. A one hope is too like despair for prudence to smother and pretty and pity from thee more dear than that from another. I can give not what men call love, but wilt thou accept not the worship the heart lifts above and the heavens reject not. The desire of the moth for the star, of the night for the morrow, the devotion of to something afar from the sphere of our sorrow. This is how he ends the poem. What, what do you think is the, is the uh, emotion of this poem? Yes, uh, he, is, he is trying to again, this uh, what I found interesting was that he is not uh, the uh, supposed or cliched love poet that we understand. So, he is talking about uh, the feeling that one uh, that he has with the beloved and that uh, he cannot express or cannot be called uh, or cannot be termed uh, in this too used or cliched word like love. So, uh, that word which is profaned is actually the word love that it has been profaned to such degree that it cannot carry my feelings and uh, cannot carry the which weight he, of his. Uh, he is aware of the difficulties. 
yes. and, 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 and he's a bit puzzled also right. and he wants to come out of it. Mm. So there is a kind of sorrow and the hidden behind his, right. his idealism. Yes. So mm. there is so there is this kind of uh, the idea of uh, love here is not something which is romance. Mm. Yes, mm. it is in fact on the other hand it is it is talking about this kind of devotion or that kind of a, um, a self annihilation as well. Mm. When he says the desire of the moth for the star mm. yeah, or when he says uh, the devotion to something afar from the sphere of our sorrow, uh, would you take that as my love? The word sorrow, yes. so th th this strikes me, mm. uh, what, what does this signify? Yes, no, but uh, from the, from the sphere of our sorrow, from this world of sorrow, okay. from this world where with that we inhabit. Of course, mm -hmm. he he knew nothing was right about his world, and he despised it. Mm -hmm. And yet, the devotion to something afar from the sphere of our sorrow, it is that devotion. Mm -hmm. It is that which he terms love. Mm -hmm. It is this desire the, of the moth to uh, towards that that uh, that goes towards the star. And he says, I can I can give not what men call love, mm -hmm. but wilt thou accept that? the worship the heart lifts above mm. and the heaven rejects not will mm. you accept that as my love so you see also he is trying to define his love how his love is not the general profane term uh, that love is it's a kind of a dialectic on one side is the difficulty on the yeah. other side is the will to survive yes and and, and the two get together and uh, make a wonderful point right and mm. of course in the, the coming back to uh, shelley's uh, essay on uh, love when he talks about there too he's trying to describe love what is love mm. what is this kind of so in that in that essay he actually says that uh, b human beings lack something innately and it is to fill this gap or this lack that they look towards this kind of affection from others. So this is how he tries to theorize even uh, love in his uh, poem, he uh, in his essay. Now he wrote the uh, Shelley is also famously known for writing a defense of poetry, and uh, which he uh, which was of course published posthumously. Uh, Shelley wrote a defense of poetry as a kind of a reaction um, against uh, what uh, Thomas Love Peacock, uh, the contemporary uh, poet thinker, had written. Now Thomas Love um, Peacock had written uh, this um, uh, uh, essay titled the four ages of poetry mm. and here in the four ages of poetry what Peacock said was that uh, the poetry had already gone through its finest stages its golden period he actually divides them into these different stages such as the iron gold silver and bronze and he says that uh, the, uh, the 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 age of satire and the age of reason was too daunting for the uh, populace, and which is why there was this inclination towards nature. And it is only because people sought novelty in this kind of pseudo simplicity. Otherwise, there is really nothing uh, in this epoch for poetry. In fact, um, Peacock urged intellectuals to move towards the new sciences and leave poetry behind. They said that he said that stop wasting time in writing poetry mm -hmm. and do some serious and and engage with serious subjects this actually angered Shelley and in response to this he uh, outlined in a defense of poetry the relevance and the power of po poetry uh, in uh, in the following in the times mm, which means there was a kind of prejudice against poetry yes, at the time of course and uh, people preferred philosophy to poetry so philosophy reason right uh, thought, or theory, uh, right, theory, theory all these things were yes. you know, superior to yes uh, the new the sciences which the were coming to the fore you can know, political theory had recently come in as a subject that could be understood or uh, read economics too at the time. Mm. So, poetry somehow took a back seat and it was, mm. uh, was considered a, was a, was a low a kind of, of a was a waste of time was a waste of time yes it for was, many it, poets. It, it was it was an effort to express one's feelings which were unreal. And unusual. romantics were also there was a lot of prejudice against the romantic poets as such because they were seen to be so a crazy lot including be, I mean <laughs> yeah yes, they, yes. that's the kind of words that they uh, that uh, critics often use for Coleridge for instance that mm. you know th this person has lost is, is riding in a state of intoxication. In fact, Coleridge feels compelled to justify why he's riding Kubla Khan when he says, uh, "Well, uh, let me justify while I'm riding. I was intoxicated. I was under the effect of a medicine." Mm. So, uh, writers too felt that they need to project a kind of defense. The very idea of defense it tells you that you have been uh, put, you have been made the target, and that you must defend your stance now. So, Shelley also feels compelled to defend the stance of poetry and the relevance of poetry. Imagine, uh, as as you were, uh, you know, explaining this idea, I th I thought of Wordsworth, I thought of Coleridge, and and I thought and I thought of uh, 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 Shelley, and I found that the problems that they created, 
uh, for themselves and for others were explained by Shelley in philosophical terms. Yes. In, in terms, you know, that would give a kind of base to uh, what, what they said. Hmm. So there is no spontaneity here. There, there, hmm. there, there are no feelings here. But feelings are always, you know, conditioned by the idea that Shelley has uh, uh, in, 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 the, in, in the time of his uh, life. Yes. So, you see, yeah. if I could quote from the very essay that we are speaking of, he says that poetry turns all things to loveliness. It exalts the beauty of that which is most beautiful mm -hmm. and it adds beauty to that which is most deformed. So, poetry can change things in such a manner. What is beautiful can be turned into uh, a higher degree and what is deformed can also appear beautiful in poetry. And he says he ma it marries exaltation and horror, grief and pleasure, eternity and change. It subdues to union under its light yoke all irrecon irreconcilable things. Again, the idea is of synthesis, that poetry synthesizes disparate things or mm. disparate elements mm. and it can create a unity or, and uh, give it a pattern uh, and a form. So, in, in fact, human sciences were more towards uh, uh, creating a society and uh, romantics were uh, for creating life as such. Right. So, on the one side was society with its structure, mm. on the other were uh, romantic poets. With, with, with the human mind which, which had imagination in it. But very interestingly, Shelley says that we are not outside the structure. Mm -hmm. uh, in his preface to Prometheus Unbound, Shelley observes and I quote that <coughs> poets not otherwise than philosophers, painters, sculptures and musicians are in one sense the creators mm -hmm. and in another the creations of their age. Mm -hmm. From this subjection, the loftiest do not escape, unquote. So, the idea is that they create, they are creators, they are also uh, building an alternate model and yet they are created, they are created in their age mm. and they are created by their age mm. and he says from this subjection, the loftiest do not escape, even the best and the loftiest cannot escape this subjection. That is a great statement of, uh, uh, of, of submission, of humility, right. that, you know, he ca calls himself a created person, right. uh, conditioned by circumstances. Circumstances. And mm -hmm. the word subjection is very important. He says, from this subjection, the loftiest do not escape. Yes. What is subjection? Mm -hmm. If we look at it from, uh, from of course, the, our own view from hindsight, uh, Althusser uh, theorizes subjection. Mm -hmm. He talks about the subject and subjection of the uh, the masses mm. and he uh, how they are molded in the, in the 20th century in the 20th century how and he theorizes the whole idea of subjection and the relationship between the biggest subject and the smallest subject and this romantic genius in the 19th century is able to anticipate right. the, the problems that would occur later. Yeah. So, no wonder uh, Shelley said that poets are the unacknowledged legislatures of the yeah. world. Mm. So, in that sense, he is able to pick up certain things which would be theorized later on see, by see critics. His, see his phrasing, legislators, right. you know, those who create laws. Who, those who write the laws. Who write the laws. And, on, and of society, mm. on how society should function. And therefore, philosophy also enters. Mm. You know, philosophy is all about writing laws of life in that sense. Mm. So, interesting how Shelley is able to, Shelley is in that sense also a philosopher a, in his own right. Mm. And yet what <laughs> Shelley, how Shelley is perceived. Now, uh, one of the critics here, G. M. Matthews in his essay, A uh, Volcano's Voice in Shelley uh, says that there is still a perilous tendency towards dualism in Shelley studies. Mm -hmm. And what is the dualism? He says, those preoccupied by the poet's symbols maintain or assume that what is worth attention on the profoundest level is his work is to be sought in domes of poetic consciousness, veils of in reality, unreality and caves of Gnostic power. Those concerned with his social interests, on the other hand, concentrate on biography and radical theory. Mm -hmm. So, this is also how Shelley has been read and perceived over the centuries. And what has the, so this kind of dualism is maintained. Some of them think him to be a poet of uh, mystery, of uh, you know, uh, of me of images, intense images, and um, uh, work on that. And the others think him to be in this kind of building up a kind of revolutionary theory. Uh, no, the word <coughs> dualism that he used, I think, is a very important word here mm. because dualism means that uh, he, he is not unilinear. 
He is not just following a straight line. But dualism also means that he seems to be a paradox, that he projects yes. absolutely different mm. attributes that seem to not cohere with one another. Mm. And therefore, uh, there is a kind of a paradox and a kind of a uh, contradiction uh, uh, or uh, I do not know in, in Shelley or this is what the criticism, contradiction in the criticism that has followed uh, so far. Uh, so, viewers, let us look at what uh, what Shelley is. Let us try to just pin it down to what uh, Shelley is known to be. So, he is a poet of ideas and of conviction. He is a passionate crusader of political social change. Hmm. He, symbols intense and mysterious are take, take over all of his poetry. He sees the latent potential in things and human beings. He combines uh, social thought with philosophy, science and secular ethics. These could be some pointers that we could use to analyze and understand uh, Shelley. Would you say something about his sensuousness? Uh, yes. Because romanticism is associated with sensuousness and mm -hmm. Keats for instance. He is a very sensuous poet in fact. Mm -hmm. He is able to evoke the kind of and uh, you see the whole idea he writes um, he writes this uh, poem, Hymn to Intellectual Beauty. Mm -hmm. Now, the idea some of the people have believed that because it is a hymn to intellectual beauty, uh, it negates uh, uh, the, the sensuous part of his nature. Because it is a hymn and an, oh, a kind of a song in praise of the beauty of the intellect, it probably negates sensuousness. So, again and sensuousness is at the center of romantic poetry as such mm -hmm. and uh, also uh, yeah, you know uh, instinct co combines with uh, the senses. Mm -hmm. Here Shelley is talking about intellectual beauty which is which probably would negate both instinct and uh, uh, sensuousness. In, in fact, intellectual beauty would uh, on beauty in it would actually uh, add the dimension of sensuousness to intellect. Right. Intellect is supposed to be dry you know very very theoretical very very rational. But when you know associate beauty with intellect mm. that means that it starts inspiring and inspiring people to work further for the goals that they have. Right. So, uh, in fact, he is able to render uh, intellect also uh, sensuous mm. in that sense because it is beautiful, beautiful yes. means uh, 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 appealing to the to, to the sight of the person. Mm. Uh, but he refers to it, it as a kind of a spirit, as a kind of a special power, as mm. kind of a shadow. Mm. He refers to this kind of intellectual beauty which is fleeting also, which stays and gives meaning to life, which uh, def gives a, a kind of definition or a sense of, sense of purpose. And yet that is it is mysterious. Mm. So, in a way uh, that kind of a uh, problematic is created, but uh, Shelley does not do so. For Shelley this intellectual beauty actually uh, gives meaning to and gives form to the sensuous life as well. It gives meaning to everything that nature is and in fact it resides in nature. It is mm. through nature that this intellectual beauty uh, enters the life of human being. So, it is not something which is outside sensuousness or is outside the sensuous. The sensuous is, is uh, the intellectual beauty is reflected in sensuousness and and that sensu then the sensuous world around the world of nature the winds that he speaks about uh, the very specific detailings that are available of um, the natural world mm -hmm. in fact mm -hmm. they actually suggest this kind that sensuousness is is a kind of a purposeful sensuousness it's not at the level of experience but that experience is guided by thought and idea Mm. And that experience then is felt in its intensity vis a vis that thought and idea. In fact, your analysis takes me to his famous poem, you know, Skylark. Right. Where, where he talks about the poetic imagination. Right, that, fl that flies off. Uh, the, yeah, that, that flies off and that takes, uh, takes one to distant lands right. and where, where the human mind starts creating things. Hmm. In fact, another poem of his mutability, uh, he visualizes the poet as the cloud hmm. and in the second stanza he says, or the liar, that is poetry as clouds. Hmm. And if I could quote from that as well, he says that we are as clouds that veil the midnight moon. Hmm. How restlessly they speed and gleam and quiver streaking the darkness radiantly, yet soon night closes round and they are lost forever. Darkness radiantly. Yes, th th again very the oxymoron paradox. kind of a, yes, yes. Uh, he's very famous mm. for that in fact. In fact, all uh, romantics are. Mm. Coleridge I think at one moment says uh, this dull pain, mm. which is also a kind of a uh, mm. oxymoron. Yes. And then in, in the second case he says, uh, he refers to this clouds as the lyre or the uh, the, 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 uh, the poetry the, itself. The instrument. Instrument, mm. yeah. And for, uh, for Shelley again, the Aeolian harp is very important mm. where, uh, the, you know, where wind 
passes through the instrument and mm. creates music. Mm. So, this kind of poetic inspiration or nature or intellectual beauty needs this kind needs to mediate needs to work upon the poet who is who is visualized as the Aeolian harp and who can write poetry. So, the poet <laughs> does not carry it does not have that innately it is something that is given to him uh, through uh, through the medium of the wind nature or uh, the muse and which is how he creates poetry finally at the end. Please throw some light on um, his attitude towards nature. You, you, you mm. use the word nature as, as a central right. co concept in, in his writing. Yes. What exactly does, does he think about nature no, and its role? Yes, and mm. I would speak, I would like to take the uh, example of Ode to the West Wind for that. Okay. Mm. Now, when he speaks of the Ode, uh, when he speaks of the West Wind, mm. then um, uh, he is referring to the wind as this kind of uh, an agent of change. Mm -hmm. So, for him nature is becomes that agent of change. Mm -hmm. For him he is also that agent of change in society. Mm -hmm. So, the wind can work on the things around. It can create, it can uh, it can uh, awaken the sleeping Mediterranean as he says. Mm -hmm. It can uh, lift the leaves etcetera and yet it cannot bring in that kind of revolution that he visualizes. For that, that particular object has to rise up. So, people have to rise up uh, to the occasion and bring in change while nature can assist them. Nature in that sense in Shelley assists a uh, human being and by nature what he means is his its primal self, the, uh, the primal instinct or the primal uh, uh, essence of. Uh, in nature also there in the human, human right, being. Right, human mm. being is a part of nature. A part of nature. And it is mm. it, and carries that essence of nature which is of course forgotten or taken over by uh, the city life mm. and yet that, that human being is very much a part of nature as wind is. And the poet for Shelley is most close to nature is more close to nature than others are because he sensitively uh, uh, he becomes one with uh, the natural world mm. and is able to bring back that kind of zest and that kind of vigor uh, to uh, act to life. So, the romantic poet identifies nature outside himself and identified nature inside himself right and he is able to see the link between the two and and therefore i think it uh, it is very much about this kind of organic uh, unity that mo that wordsworth probably uh, uh, showcases in his poetry mm. and here in uh, such as in ode to west wind he he talks about the west wind how the west wind uh, in autumn uh, you know goes over these different lands. So, it takes the leaves from one place, it can bring it in a, at another place, it can throw the seeds, but finally the seeds will uh, come to life much later. So, the poets can sp the poet can spread his ideas and th but they will take time to shape and take shape later, mm -hmm. but there is a kind of optimism in this kind of life. Also, uh, as in nature as in the seasons like in Ode to West Wind, uh, he refers to all the seasons in this particular poem. It is it is as if Shelley uh, very clearly means that life is life has these different seasons and if there is a moment of uh, uh, you know uh, of uh, oppression then it is bound to be taken over by uh, the forces of liberation mm -hmm. and so it and hence the revolution as well you know how how the seasonal change is also seen to be a kind of change in life so he so the forces of active in society which are oppressive will be overtaken by forces which uh, actually are free in po in poetry and in life according to shelley so, please uh, put these ideas together and, and, and conclude in your own manner. Yes. So, basically uh, when we are speaking of uh, uh, Shelley, then uh, we need to look at him as much as a poet who is a poet of nature as mm. we take all romantic poets to be, but he is very much also a poet of society mm. because he is not, he is not escaping from society. He is actually not even uh, building an alternate world somewhere else. When he builds a world, he is actually reflecting his uh, in a way drawing an analogy between real life and the life that he projects in his poems. In fact, he uses poetry very effectively to, um, uh, to explain the complex phenomena of change of, uh, of historical processes as they take place in life. So, I think he, he in fact mingles uh, or uh, blends this uh, the, the historical approach with the romantic in his uh, verses. This is my so understanding of uh, History Shelley. on one side, 
human beings on the other and that in fact breaks the barriers of nationalism he is not an english poet he is a european poet he is a poet of humanity mm. and he is a poet of change right Th- this seems to be the framework you know in which you have built up your argument mm. and uh, That's right. very 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 effectively uh, so viewers uh, dr richa bajaj has uh, talked about shelley as a romantic poet uh, who was also a revolutionary and by revolutionary is meant that you know positive intervention that human beings make in order to make the world better and uh, for that you know uh, the the mind is to be used uh, nature is to be involved uh, social structures have to be reinterpreted and then you know the romantic poet would be able to do his task uh, appropriately so i believe uh, that there are important points here uh, there are no definitive answers anywhere because uh, shelley is a poet of experiment shelley is a poet of uh, exploration and in fact he excites us he makes us conscious about the the human tasks you know uh, that, that that all of us have and 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 which are one, one, one to work for so uh, uh well i i think it's a uh, that way uh, uh, a, a lecture uh, which gives us uh, a, a food for thought and we have to go further into it and we have to see the link between what uh, shelley imagined in the early part of the 19th century uh, with you know what later on happened so uh, with this lecture uh, we, we come to the end of uh, the discussion uh, on on shelley and uh, we'll be taking up other poets of uh, romantic trend later thank yeah. you Thank you Dr. Bajaj. Thank you. <laughs>